work, he has a special surprise. So uh, you'll see uh, why we get so excited about this. So I am pleased to introduce our speaker and lovely wife. His lovely wife. Is she here tonight? Did you bring? There she is. Okay, good. For this evening's presentation, Ron and Patty Buckley are members of this organization and wanted to to specify that because they paid their dues. <laughs> Residents of the City of Union. Now Ron has developed this program as he did the first presentation, the first of the series, last January. But Patty's the one at the keyboard. She's got the tough job. And together they make a great team. And last year I explained that Ron had spent so many hours digging in the dirt on what is now Duke Energy's property, looking for refuse, garbage dumps, and things like that that are exactly where archaeologists dig to find evidence of past human habitation. Now during 2014, Ron has spent just as much time, if not more, digging around the traces of Jacob Pyatt's Federal Hall its kitchen garden, its garbage dump, its overgrown fence rows, and so forth. Again, we must recognize what this project means to both Ron and Patty, and the county of Boone, and for that matter, the state of Kentucky. And we need to express our deep appreciation for all the work they've done and continue to do to preserve Boone County's history. Now in Ron's former life, he's worked on everything from jet engines for GE to excavating archeological sites in Mexico with Penn State graduate archeology span students. And then, as if that wasn't enough, he worked as a registered nurse before his retirement. For 17 years he was a nurse. And now he's immersed in archaeology once again. He loves it so much he keeps coming back to it. Now so let us express our grateful appreciation to Ron Buckley. beginning of my fourth year out at uh, Jacob Hines. Uh, I was also working for four years out at Robert Pines. Uh, Jacob Pines, I thought it was going to end probably this year. If you look at the big white uh, board over there on the left, I thought I had four sites that I was working on. But now due to some new information from a new program called LIDAR, which mixes together radar and light, you can actually see the ground through the trees. I now have 18 sites, so I'm going to be very busy for quite a few years, and if I don't get them all done, somebody else is going to have to step in. Uh, there's an awful lot of material we've got to go through. I'll try and go through it as fast and accurately as I can. If there's any questions afterwards, Underneath that big white sign, you'll see uh, some tear-offs uh, with my name, phone number, and email. So if you have any questions, I'll be more than happy to work with you. Okay? First thing we're going to do is do an update. Don't push back. An update on uh, the Pyatt's, the Robert Pyatt's. Uh, last year at this time, we found two gravestone uh, bases and one little piece of a gravestone. Uh, I heard that there were some surveyors out there uh, at Roberts because they're going to be putting in a new pit to bury their ashes or whatever in. And I spoke to them to see if they'd found anything I haven't. They said that the graveyard they finally found after two weeks, I told them it only took me two years. Uh, they told me it wasn't very big, it was only about six by six, and I said, no, you're wrong. I have photographs from the air of the first tombstones near this tree, and everything goes back from there. Well, we went out there, and we were kicking some logs around, and lo and behold, a whole bunch of new partial tombstones came up. Uh, up here on the top right, 
all that area is new. They're all new parts of stones. And uh, so from there, go ahead and put it. Uh, I decided the only thing I could do with this graveyard, because I don't have any ground penetrating radar, there's only so much I can do. I figured out based upon uh, the land and the photographs how wide it was and how long it was. It's about 60 feet wide and about 160 feet long. This things were pushed out. So I got some PVC uh, pipes and put in in each corner, GPS them, did a scale drawing, and that is in Duke Energy's hands so that we don't have a, the rest of the graveyard moved down like they did in the 70s. That was absolutely atrocious. The next picture is a picture of my wife who comes out with me on these jaunts now and then. We were trying to get accurate measurements. As you can see, it's pretty darn tough. Uh, these weeds, uh, they grow in amongst themselves. It's all you can do to walk through some of the area. Uh, before leaving, I also put in some uh, one foot long uh, PVC pipes with uh, red spray around the top and some uh, red uh, ribbon type stuff put on it so that in the future, if somebody wanted to know exactly where those pieces were, they're there, they're marked. They cannot be overlooked. Uh, one of the people who uh, previously we know was buried there it was in the newspaper. <coughs> Uh, was a Ryan family. Uh, that's Elizabeth. She died at 14 years. Uh, guess what? Two of the little tiny tombstones were found with ER and JR. That could have been their children too. Those are all out there. Uh, I came across another stone that had on it R-I-N-E. Well, what names begin and have an R-I-N-E on it? There's not too many. How about Christine or Catherine? I mean, Catherine. I found out that uh, there was a Huff in the area. It ends up, it was Catherine Huff. Her husband was Thomas. Uh, they got married in 35, 1835. And he was actually a postmaster out there at uh, Robert Pius that we discussed last year. We have documentation that that existed out there. And he was a postmaster there. After his wife died, he went on with his uh, son over to Indiana and lived there. <coughs> uh, D. Hart Run. Last time I was here, I said I could find no evidence of D. Hart. It still is not on any map. But some information came available. I went out to where uh, it was supposed to be, and this is what it looks like. It used to be a creek that went to a pond. The pond is dried up. The creek, as you can see, is completely swollen with uh, uh, logs and that from the river. That's, and there it is, completely choking it up. So you cannot really do any work out there at all in any way, shape, or form. Uh, that is the hard one. How did I find that out? Uh, January through March this last year, I spent most of my time in. Uh, uh, Burlington Courthouse going through old documents. And what did I find? I found a document from April 18, 1860, where the Pyatts are fighting each other over a piece of land. And up here, Mount of Dehart Run. From there, uh, other names, I had to try and trace that land down based upon a couple names that were on that document because they always referred to different people. And names like uh, Hasting came up. Uh, then I tracked all the other people in the area because these people were exchanging land back and forth. Uh, it all mentioned, they always mentioned the mouth of Dehart Run. So then we try and pinpoint a little bit more. Uh, you can see up there Hastings, and you can see Neil. The red arrow there shows you a map error. Uh, basically, that map showed that creek 
which is you know, going straight over to the river. It really didn't. Uh, I knew there was something wrong. I couldn't find out what it was. So I got a hold of the University of uh, Kentucky, the gentleman there who helped me. And he started finding other maps to see what was going on. And you can see it's starting to curve upward. Okay? Uh, both Mr. Stevens and Mrs. Dwyer uh, told me that uh, they had let out boats onto that first arrow go back path. Yeah, left there. <coughs> Mr. Stevens said, yes, we did lay boats come out here. People would come up to visit us. And Mr. Dwyer said, well, there is another one a little bit further down. And Mr. Stevens said, there never was a creek there. I went and looked at it. He's right. There's no evidence that a creek ever existed. So the latest map from 1981 actually shows it going across the road and bending up and turning left. And that's the way it is today. And that is the art run. There's just no doubt about it. Uh, most of the uh, documents I look at, if you look at my 2014 book, You'll see it'll tell you deed, the uh, deed index and the page number that you can find all this information on so that other people don't have to go through all this. Uh, there's an aerial view today. Uh, the black arrow there pointing, there's a white uh, or lighter area uh, right above it there a little. That's uh, Don Clare's place and right below it is Mrs. Dwyer's place. Mrs. Dwyer told me the packet ships used to actually stop there. Uh, Don Clare, uh, he's always out looking at something. Well, in the 1990s, he did find some debris. Uh, he found this uh, piece of pottery, and I did some research on it. Basically, found it was made by Hamilton Jones and Greenboro, PA, in the 1850s. <coughs> he also found some other uh, stoneware, etc. The top piece up there, uh, white with the black uh, emblem on it, uh, that really helped me because I found the same type of pottery over on Robert Pines. Uh, that proved out there was just enough information on there to find out who they were. It was T. Booth and Company of Versolum and Tunzel in Stratford, uh, England, 1862 to 1872. So now let's go forward and look at the history of uh, the Pyops just a little. Uh, Jacob's first wife was Hannah McCullough. She died 1818. His second wife was Martha Huddy. She died in 1842. Uh, he did purchase the land in 1799, and by 1804 he had this monstrous building completely built. Uh, somebody with real engineering talents helped him with that. We'll look at that. His military career uh, was quite extensive. Uh, he was on an expedition to Canada, uh, Battle of Three Rivers, Battle of Short Hills, New Jersey, Battle of Brandywine, Battle of White Horse Tavern, Battle of Crosswood Bridge, Battle of Monmouth. Monmouth was interesting. That's where uh, Lee did charge when he was supposed to and he started to retreat. Uh, Jacob Pyle actually heard him swear at uh, Lee profanity. And at that point, I believe, uh, Lafayette was put in control. So the Pyatt actually served under Lafayette for a little bit. Uh, he did go on. Uh, he did go on. He was adjutant general for Washington at Valley Forge under those difficult times. There is a book in the library now with those complete orders for that period of time. It's 200 pages long. You will find that in the main sheet of the library. Uh, some of the interesting points on there uh, shows the activities of daily life, like 12-18, set aside day for the men to be thankful to God and express their sins. January 15th, Commander-in-Chief Washington requests the presence of the Marquis de Lafayette. January 28th, field officers to meet and agree on how to exchange rawhide 
for shoes and a way to get bayonets and pipes for their officers. Then there's orders to get uh, Lafayette some horses. Uh, there's orders for men to get 100 lashes for stealing uh, from the local people. Uh, others for uh, desertion. And then there's an execution order on uh, February 26th. And then uh, he's basically stated that the drummers are to stay in the front of the line. This is document 524-1785, where uh, Jacob Hyatt became uh, part of the Sons of the American Revolution, that group. It was a very prestigious group. Uh, we get into the land history of Jacob Hyatt. I probably put too much in there. I'll try and slim it down a little. Uh, this is where uh, the Charles Thurston got a patent for that particular land on May 22, 1780. Uh, this is where uh, Jacob actually got his land. He did not get a land grant. He actually bought the land with John Watts. They bought 100 acres for 300 pounds. Later, uh, he and uh, uh, Mr. Watts split it into half, and each one of them paid a dollar for the other person's half, you know, so they could each balance out. Uh, this is what I call the long form. This is what I was telling you. If you ever want to find any information, this will show you each transfer of land that occurred with that property over 200 years. And it will tell you the deed book and the page and the date and how much they paid for it. I have a shorter form. This is so that you can grasp all this easier. I can anyway. Jacob Hyatt had the land. He had a son, Abraham, that he left it to. Abraham, about 1845, decided to take the 116 acres that was a ferry site and sell the other 350 acres to uh, Jacob W. Pyatt. And, see, the, oh, this is showing the split up of the land and the ferry. What happens is a big chunk of land broke in half in the 1840s. One was to become the ferry, the other was to become the farmland. Both, both were owned by the pipes. At that point, it goes through all these people, all this period of time, and in 1977, it's all brought together by the Perrin family. The Perrin family lives in Ohio. Uh, they are long lost, shall we say, relatives of the pipes. They bought it because they were relatives and for an investment. It's a heck of an investment. It's got almost two miles of riverfront. Uh, this is, I always put these things in here because it's easy for somebody to say something, this is what happened, but it's better to show examples of it. Uh, this is Jacob Pyatt's uh, will. On that, he says there at the bottom that uh, she's received like $57 a month as long as she's a widow. Pay for her upkeep. Okay. And the next one there is where uh, he's actually giving all the land to Jacob Pyatt in the beginning. So basically, you've got, uh, uh, excuse me, Abraham Pyatt. You've actually got Jacob Pyatt giving to Abraham, Abraham Pyatt, and that splits into Wyckoff Pyatt, and then also into, uh, sorry, lost my mind, into. Uh, Oh, Abraham kept his for the um, ferry. Uh, there's one interesting part in this whole page, which is what I call a long form of the pie of the ferry. We're not going to go into. Uh, on 817, he sold the ferry and its rights for $2,200 to his family court. He came back the same day and rebought it for $7,700. Don't know why. Okay? Actually happened. Uh, when this land was broke up, though, uh, right of way uh, was given through the uh, ferry property forever, and it is still to this day. Uh, we're not going to go through all this. This is what I call the short form on the ferry and exactly what happened. Uh, 
They actually had that land until 1873, the Pyatt family, and then it got sold over uh, to other folks. Uh, the Jacob Pyatt that you're talking about with all the uh, land up at the house, uh, the land was to be uh, sold as needed for his seven children to get school. Uh, he said whichever one became interested in being a farmer, he would receive all this land uh, when he turned 21. He also said a very interesting comment which really holds true today. Their children are to be raised at Federal Hall away from the contaminating influence of cities and towns. And that does exist. So can I ask a question? Is Jacob the Abraham's son, nephew, what's the relationship? Uh, Jacob is uh, Benjamin's son. Okay. And okay. Benjamin is a brother to Abraham? Uh, yes. Okay. Yes. Sorry, I didn't explain that better. Uh, next is a map of Federal Hall. And you can see up there, uh, uh, we said that the land went to uh, Charles Pike. You can see him right there uh, next to the river. And if you look down below, this is a very important creek. It's called Second Creek. The uh, ferry is right down in here, the ferry site. And you'll see this other uh, buildings, et cetera, in there that I'm working on now that I didn't know were there to try and find out what their influence was on everybody. This is what I was telling you about earlier. The red dots are what I have looked at. And now let's all the blue dots pop up in the last 60 days, and I will be very busy. My grandson, Santi L., he comes out with me once a week and he'll help me. <laughs> but to get a better understanding of what is actually happening out there, uh, you can see at the top center there, there's Jacob Pyatt's house, 4,300 feet away, as the crow flies, is the ferry site. Uh, the graveyard is 255 feet almost straight across, and uh, the 200 foot mark is some buildings we found that uh, were there that we didn't know were there previously. And then down at the bottom right is 300 feet away is the hay barn. So that's the way the site is actually laid out. Uh, this is an aerial photograph uh, showing where the house and the walkway is. The walkway is it's hard to see. But it basically starts here and goes clear up to the other end of that big field. These are two huge fields that they farm. And the house is right in here, and here's the field right in front of it. <coughs> I heard that uh, this house was really fancy. That it had uh, double-decker uh, decks front and rear. Uh, I was over at Thomas Moore looking up some information and I actually found the pictures of from the front to back. They did it. There they are. This was a very fancy place. Uh, you see the uh, shutters on the lower picture? When the fire above burned the place, uh, most of the wood got destroyed. You will see a piece of the shutter there. It's the only thing really left. But it's very interesting. It's extremely thick wood and it's fancy fluted in the front. It, they were green. I, I saw the green paint off when I got it, but it's starting to come off now. Thanks to Mr. Schiffer, we found out a lot more. If he hadn't gotten up on those wintry days in an airplane and taken pictures, we would have missed out on things. Uh, here's a picture of the house. The actual stone house did not include this building here. This was added on. It was all wood. Uh, there was a road that went all the way around, and they raised basically tobacco up there, whereas the lower fields were all corn. Well, here's where Adobe Photoshop comes in. You see the basic building there, but I thought I saw something, so I used Adobe Photoshop to enhance it. 
and there's buildings up there. <coughs> the other interesting thing about this picture is that you can see the trails that the snow has filled in. You can see this was a very busy area. If you take this one over, you go straight to the barn. But then you have this one going to those buildings. And then checking with various people, people like the Helmers, etc. cetera, uh, they were told that those were slave quarters back when. And the people that lived there in the McGuire's uh, said that they were there, they were rickety as could be, extremely old back in the 1950s. Here's another shot. Uh, this is a shot from what would be the front of the house away from the river. Uh, the other side that looked at the river, he actually had a large window there, a double window. It was huge. By the 1970s, it had been completely looted. Uh, it was in a state of decay. After the roof was built, burned down, it decayed even faster. The whole inside of it was plastered, plastered walls. The outside was all painted white. There is one wall that still has white paint on it. So the inside's deteriorating. You can see the wood boards and that there. Here's the uh, front door today. I don't know how this stone is sitting there. You have a couple of little ones there. And you've got that big stone there, and they're holding on for dear life. One of the ones I found, there were two or three of them just laying around. You can see the edge marks on them. Uh, very old, they appear to be chestnut, and they're as solid as stone today, even laying out all this weather for 60, 70 years. Here's another shot of it a little further back. Uh, this center portion right here. It's about 30 foot high, 15 foot deep at least, and 30 foot across. Up in the top of the part on that side, you had a uh, fireplace, and then a larger one down below. You can still see those. This is a picture of the basement, which is about uh, 8 foot deep. And here again, you see another one of those windows. Uh, there's two cisterns there that are both stone lined, even to this day. Somebody asked me if I'd been down there, and I said, no. <laughs> <laughs> My wife, I had to find somebody else on her summer. Uh, there's some of the plaster that's still on the walls. There's not a lot there. On the other side, uh, where the fireplaces are, there's still plaster. There's still a bit of white plaster. There. I did find some marks on one, like uh, somebody had tried to make it look fancy. I have that at home. May I ask a question? Is, is there a way to uh, preserve that plaster when it's it's in the elements of tower? Because what it's made of. I've taken a couple samples and kept them at home. That's about all I can do. Uh, that pine shutter that I told you about, that's, that's uh, not just, that's something else. Uh, I've got to find a wood preserver to put on that. There's just no wood left. And it actually has a hinge on it. Oh, a fireplace. Uh, the upper one is the small one for the second floor, and the larger one below. The one below still has a keystone in it. Uh, you will see some plaster on the side there, too, still present. Especially in these two areas, here and here. Well, I couldn't resist taking this picture. This is a real balancing act. You can see there's just nothing holding it. I took the picture because I knew it wouldn't be there. It is now gone. Uh, here's pictures in April. Uh, you can see the place still has daffodils growing in two different places. 
And then you see the main structure I told you, which is the center part, how big that really is. I mean, it's, it's huge. It really is. Uh, before I go any further, I'm having him hand out a couple of the LIDAR pictures that I told you about where you can go through trees and everything. Uh, the land is extremely rough. Uh, if you walk 50 minutes up and down these hills, you can get there. If you've got a pack on, you've got a shovel, and a metal detector, and a weed eater, it gets pretty tough. It really does. Yeah, I'll pass those around just so people can get a feel of what the area is. Uh, we decided one day that we could get the Jeep up there on this uh, trail. It didn't work. Triple A couldn't get me. We had to find a way to grab it to get the car back. And then later I took uh, two of my grandsons up there. They swore they'd never go out with me again. It started raining while we were up there. And that trail is just dirt. Need I say how many times I fell? They swore they never would me again. <laughs> uh, here's basically just a cross drawing uh, of what it looks like now. What it's like. Uh, when we go in and we look at the barn or whatever, we draw it, we measure it, we scale drawings. So that somebody in the future will know what was there. This is the main structure. This is a little section that was added, which was all wood. This is all of this wall, which fell down and literally just went close like that. I think this is where the privies are that I don't have time to dig. Up here, I noticed this last year, they put these stones in for a little landing. There are three different debris sites there. You gotta remember these debris sites were 200 years of leftovers. This one goes about 40 feet deep. It's the number one site that has most of everything. That uh, picture you saw of the porcelain and metal, that was found by the clear room here. What's interesting is on one of the other pictures, uh, the LIDAR pictures, it shows that a building was in here but I have nothing to prove it. But yet we found debris over here, so I've got to look at that this year and see if there really was one. It's very, very tough to work with. This is the back where they threw everything out. And this is the angle that I work at. Metal detection, search, whatever. And of course, if you get any rain at all, you're usually working on your knees. Uh, you cannot imagine how much stuff is there. It's, it's frightening. And you got to remember that this dirt with all the rain for 200 years is washing things down and covering them up. When the back wall goes on that section, it'll take an unbelievable effort to even try and do any more work there. But you can see the things in the front there of what I have found. Well, my grandson here that came up here and proud to me one day. I said, Grandpa, you missed this. It's part of, it goes along with their cast iron uh, stoves and furnaces and that. It's a real fancy uh, piece of metal that was around the outside of it. We did find one colonial button plaque had on a gill, which means basically it had one coat of brass on it. Uh, I think these are parts of uh, a heavy stove. Uh, what I can't figure out is whether I look at this site or I look at Robert Pyatt's site, the metal seems to be red. I don't know if that's something to do with the iron and the fire or if it was painted or what. I can't figure it out. Uh, these are some of the locks and hinges that were found. Uh, if you look over on the table, you'll see one lock where the brass on the inside of it was actually melted from the heat of the fire when they set it on fire. Uh, here's just some of the pottery. Uh, 
there's an awful lot of it. I just tried to give a presentation, a representation of it there. There's a fancy locket. Don't know when it dates from, can't tell. It was just a little locket laying there. Way down at the bottom of that uh, incline that I was telling you about, you can see there's a shoe repair done. That probably dates 1870s, 1880s. Uh, there's a file down on the bottom. I actually found, uh, you women don't know about this probably, your old curlers that they used to put on a fire or a hot stove and use those. Found one of those there. Yes. Uh, this is part of a cast iron bed. Uh, the slave quarter area is found outside of that. I can't guarantee it was slave quarter area, but it really seemed like it was. Everything I've learned. Uh, it's sort of nice to find the key to the house, even though it isn't all there. <laughs> a lot of nails. Well, here again, my grandson's company. The second item more from the left is a stepper that was used to get into uh, a buggy. Over at the uh, barn area, we did find uh, an axle that went to a buggy. Then there's part of a hatchet there. This is just a artist, uh, bring the deck height to us back foundation. Yeah. Of what we thought it might look like before we found the area. Yeah, the fairy area. But that isn't what it looked like. Next. Uh, this is a fantastic document. It is so well preserved, it's unbelievable. This was April 21st, 1800, where both Pyatt and Watts started a ferry together for 20 pounds. Okay, you come up and you have a road that swings right and goes up to the top of the hill. Then you have a road that goes up that's a driveway. And to the left they you have an old dirt road that went out to where the ferry site was. This is the driveway going up to the house that's within 100 feet of that site. We had to get a saw, an axe, a weed eater to even get up through it. It's just so overgrown. I don't know who that woman is. <laughs> uh, that's called a burr oak tree. Uh, I had a gentleman over from uh, uh, Forestry. He told me he did ID it as a burr oak, and he said they're a very slow growing tree. He said that tree is at least 200 years old. You can see the roots exposed there, still working. <coughs> At that site where the house is, that we know was there prior to 1840s, there's two stone walkways. You can see the branches laying in one. The walls around them are starting to collapse. The stairs are starting to collapse. This is just I'm going to go through this real fast. Uh, remember I told you that uh, Abraham took 116 acres for the ferry site? Uh, very fortunate that they drew that map in there. You can see the house uh, that was there, which helps date that house. You can see Second Creek here, <coughs> and there's the Ohio River. And that's 116 acres that he talked about. And as you go through the other deeds, there's no doubt about that that is the ferry site because it does uh, say in all the deeds uh, it talks about this land being next to the mouth of the uh, second creek which is where the uh, site was the uh, <coughs> excuse me ferry site next. the next one is just to show you that uh, other farm area uh, that the other brother got a hold of and down at the bottom there the very bottom it, had that uh, right away that I told you about, and that still exists today. Like I said, we do detail on the drawings and measurements. Uh, the house itself, the original stone house was right here. I do not know what these two concrete slabs are for. You have a stone wall down here that comes up, 
as part of the house, you have at least a 30-foot drop-off. So what you've got is the house sitting up here in a 30-foot drop-off into the ferry-type site, which completely covers up with water if we get any rain at all. These were bricks. Uh, there was evidently a brick wall and a basement there. Uh, up here at the top, the steep bank, uh, very steep. Uh, you've got about a 50-foot drop-off right next to it, the house. It gets even uh, steeper. I have found no ceramics. Okay, I found a little metal uh, up in there, but uh, it appears that what they did was just throw it over the side, but the side's like this. And I can't climb up and down, but there's no way to get hurt. Uh, there is still more work to do there. This is some of the pieces that were found there, locks, part of a, an old uh, uh, steel pot, that type of thing. That's, uh, you find a lot of uh, nails there, uh, and a lot of spikes. Pat, can you go back one? Oh, one more. To the drawing. All those nails were found in one place, right in here. So when they took the house apart, somebody took the time to take the nails out and throw them away and take the wood. Uh, up in the house area, we found this damper and parts of a cast iron stove. Uh, I can't remember the name. The name is on it, and it dates to 1860s. Let's go on to the barn area. Uh, the barn area has that left wall, stone wall, <coughs> and then it's got uh, some stone sections to act as a place for uh, the uh, Pardon? Yeah, for the roof support, the poles going up to it. There's tons of metal in it. You can do no metal detecting at all. Next. Well, my wife thought I was mad. You know? That's what happens when you carry all that equipment up. You see those weeds are taller than me. I have March, April, and May to have a good chance of doing anything up there. And after that, you, you spend a whole day cutting out a few feet so you can look at it. Uh, that's what happens when you're completely tired and exhausted after the ski is heat and carry everything. Sir, can't, can't you just put some roundup out there? Pardon? Can't you just round up that area? Yeah, I guess. Well, round up. Round up. Round up. Round up. Round up. I'd be broke. <laughs> the weeds out there, I cannot express how bad it is to work out there. Uh, there's a drawing of the barn, and all the center of sections for support and what's left. You can see there's a little door way on the right, on the left it was much bigger. Uh, any metal we found was on the left side. There's a picture of the axle, and then uh, two big uh, bar spikes for about three foot long that were found there. There's a horseshoe. Little nails. Uh, down at the bottom, there's a hinge and some miscellaneous stuff. Some of it I just can't identify. Well, here we get into something very interesting. Uh, for three years, I have chased down the DAR plaque and the tombstone of Jacob Pyle. I have handed out circulars to the only two roads that a person could go on to get that out of there. I've had a workup in the local newspaper. I've handed out uh, handbills, like I said, to everybody on those two roads, even out to Rabbit Hatch. And could not find it. Just could not find it. Well, it was online a couple days ago that uh, we were going to have this meeting. And out of the clear blue, a fellow sitting in the room here, Bob and his wife Nancy Schwartzel, I think you pronounce it, at the Willis Graves uh, house, bed and breakfast, called Matt Becker and said, I've got that here. Why doesn't somebody come and take it? 
there it was. It's been sitting there for about 15, maybe 20 years. Just an unbelievable thing. I, I really worked hard on that. Well, I've got to get something to drink. My grandson's going to talk to you for a couple minutes on the graveyard. Thank you very much for the great stuff. This was dug up. 
it sunk down about this far. Uh, over here, there was another compression. There is no way in my mind that there can only be four or five people buried there. It has to stretch further. Uh, I've tried to get a ground penetrating uh, unit to run across because it's smooth, but so far I haven't found one. Uh, that's the only other way. Uh, I'm going to try and check the local graveyards uh, next to it too to see if any of the plants in that area were buried there. But you have, you'll see later on, he took on indentured servants, he took on other kids that were homeless, uh, he had slaves, uh, there's like four generations of them lived there. There's no way that that's all there is to that graveyard. It can't be. But I've done everything I can at this point to try and find the other parts of it. I, I know it exists. we cleaned out even further this year. Uh, once a year, uh, Santiago and I go back there and uh, completely clean it out. Uh, I'm trying to get a local tenant farmer to help me move some of the heavier trees that have fallen out so I can search further. <coughs> this is the other thing I've looked for for three years. The DAR plant. This has been a tough one too. There's a reward poster I put out and gave to everybody in the neighborhood and got absolutely no response at all. And I wanted to hand it out to everybody on those roads because there's only one way that they could possibly get in there, and that's on that dirt road. And it must have really been tough. They could have possibly gone through Helmers, but I don't see how they get anything up and down his hills. It's even worse. Finally, I lucked out. First of all, I forgot to mention, if it wasn't for all the people that have helped me anywhere from Utah to Florida to local people like the Hodges, etc., uh, the Hillary Delaney's and the library and everything, I could not have found all this information. It took at least 25, 30 people working with me. Uh, the McGuire's, the Pyatt's, everybody has been fantastic. This fellow lives in Florida, but he's a real computer guru. He found somehow this email, and the email says on it that uh, it had been taken twice and brought back twice for $100, and he was taking them to the Pine, Benjamin Pyatt Pioneer House uh, up in Ohio, Libertyville, West Liberty. Uh, so I called somebody that worked the realtors up there, and one of the realtors, her name Shelby, was very nice to me. And she found out the history on the house. It had been sold quite a few times recently. And went through one by one until we narrowed it down to a couple. And then uh, Margaret Pyatt up there, Pyatt's Castle, she'd been very good. Uh, she actually found out who supposedly bought it for a hundred bucks. So I called, got no response, wrote a letter. wrote a letter explaining to him how important it was for us to get this back to Boone County, which is what it refers to, and how important it is to us. And I offered him $500,000, which is my Social Security check for him. <laughs> Heard nothing. Then he, I finally got a hold of him, and it's, it's not that he knew my phone numbers. They just don't answer their phone. So then finally he did answer it once, gave me a cell phone, and said, I, he described it completely. He had to get the dust off of it, he said. He described it completely. And uh, he said, I don't know if we want to get rid of it or not. And I said, what are you doing? He says, we're well, just sitting here. He said, I don't know if I'll get rid of it, but if he'll come up to West Liberty and give me a presentation on clients, I'll consider it. Well, it's a two and, a half, two and a half hour drive. I said, sure. You name the date. So he was supposed to call me and he did so I called him. No response. The gentleman that's got it is Mr. Ryan Cole in West Liberty, 
2396 West 2245. Got his phone number here, got his cell phone number here. This is all in the book. It's in the library for 2014. In case someone else can try and help carry this further. We do need that back. We really do. Community involvement. These pipes were something else. They were very aggressive people. They came in here and put up a house. Before the house was even built, they had a ferry going. Then they got into everything else. Political, community service, you name it. They were there. Uh, on this document, there's a brother and sister of the Reed family that he's taking in as indentured servants. The girls stay there till she's 16. She's to be taught spinning, writing, and reading. Next. The next is her brother, Benjamin Wright. Uh, he's to stay there till he's 21 and learn how to be a farmer, learn reading, writing, but in addition, math. I guess they felt women should know math at that period of time. And it talks about the threes. I think that must be some type of algebra from what I've heard. Uh, they were to be given uh, three pounds of some shillings and a uh, new bunch of clothes uh, when they left. Uh, another family, the Alloway family, uh, here he's uh, going to be the guardian of five children. He's assessing their slaves for them, administering the state and take care of that. Uh, at one time, there must have been at least 15 people living in that quiet house at Federal Hall. Here he is, as I was telling you about. Uh, he's marking paths for the roads to the courthouse, to Bulletsburg. Here, uh, uh, Second Creek to the... Yeah, Second Creek to the courthouse. 1801, uh, Second Creek, Newport. So here's what he's doing. He's got his house there. He's got his ferry there. Should he people have to get to Lawrenceburg? Lawrenceburg can use some of their products. He's expanding the roads into northern Kentucky and increasing his wealth and everything else. Very smart gentleman, believe me. Uh, he also uh, served as county commissioner. Uh, he also, let's see, where's that at? The next one. On the next one, he served as a judge for a few days. He served as a surveyor. These are all pictures of the actual documents. Looking at agriculture at Federal Hall, there's that famous Schiffel picture again. Uh, these are the actual cornfield areas down below uh, the house and going to the right. Uh, can anybody tell me in that highest one what those rectangles are? Anybody have any idea? I don't think they're wagons. I don't know what Today, if you go down there, the first of those fields, this is what it looks like. The rest of it is completely wooded, muddy, all the time, uh, very heavy brush, and every now and then a kamikaze pilot I've been with will drive me through it, right? <laughs> Who won't mention his name? Uh, this is very interesting. 1898 to 1912, an Enoch White, White family lived there. Uh, the grandson, Daryl White, works right here at this library. He did not know that his uh, grandfather actually owned Federal Hall at one time. He thought they were all tenant farmers. He actually owned it for about seven years. Uh, he was into slavery, Mr. Pyatt. You can see this is from the tax records. Uh, it shows how many uh, white indentured servants, how many black slaves, how many horses. They got taxed on that and their land. The form is very difficult to read. This is what it looks like. If you go in column by column with a, a magnifying glass, you can read uh, what it says. 
Something else I found that was very interesting uh, at the courthouse, the slave book uh, for slave certificates. Basically, anybody in the 20s and the 1830s that came in with slaves had to say they were coming there to live and that their slaves were to be used on their property and not sold. That's in the library, or in the courthouse. Mr. Pike did not like his slaves running away. This appeared in the paper. It talks about uh, some of the slaves running away. They were arrested by his brother, uh, Mr. Pyatt, up in uh, Ohio. But the abolitionists got him and got him out of there before he could get up there and get him and take him back. So then he tried to sue the railroad for some reason, I don't know why, to try and uh, get money back from the slaves. There was other interesting things going on at the uh, the Pyatt area in Second Creek. A Mr. Currently had two slaves who decided to beat up and kill a slave from the Jones family. One slave who didn't, wasn't really active got 50 lashes bareback. The other guy got hung. Just a side note. Uh, getting into interviews with different people, this is one of your main sources find any history around here. You must speak to the people that are as old as I am or older, especially if you find somebody in their late 80s, early 90s. You can learn up so much as to what was going on. Uh, like I said, the uh, land was purchased by the Perry brothers because they were related to them and they wanted it as an investment. Uh, Mr. Perry states there were no tenant farmers there in the 1977 and on when they uh, uh, bought the property. They said the house was in good shape. The DAR plaque was there. The tombstone was there. So that was all present when they were there. However, in 1978, the Chief Bill Burkle that I spoke to in Petersburg uh, Fire Department told me they got a call if there was a fire up there. He couldn't get up. He just burned. That was where the fire was set on fire. So we got an idea of how it was murdered. Uh, Mr. Helmer uh, lives up next to that. Uh, he said there weren't even any tenant farmers there in the 1950s that he knew of. Uh, so he said the cemetery was small, but there were at least 12 different gravestones there. Mentions uh, talk about the slave quarters that had been passed on to him as being that one building. <coughs> this gentleman tried to come tonight. His name is Don McGuire. Yeah, there he is. Uh, he couldn't come. He was on auction that his wife just had to have an emergency operation. She's not in good shape. This gentleman was very helpful to him. Uh, he's on auction. He wants to go back up and see it. I've told him that probably April when things are better at his house, but I will get him up there. The significance of the McGuire family, they were the last ones to live at Federal Hall. They literally gave up uh, and came down to the landing area because it was so cold, so remote, there's no heat except what they can burn, no electricity. The winds were terrible. The kids had to walk up a mile and a half to two miles up and down these hills twice a day to get the bus. And they just found William and Burl. So he came down to this house you see in the center. Uh, that's his family on the left. The house you see in the center, which is right there uh, where the landing is. It's all gone now. He said they lived there in the 1940s and the 50s. And he talks about how hard it was on the three kids there to live there. Uh, he says at that point in time, that double deck front and back only had uh, a double deck, or only had a deck on the front lower level. That was it. Uh, they said that farming there was absolutely excellent that the uh, owner just loved it was producing so much. And he says at that time the stone was there, but it was cracked in the 1940s and 50s. Mr. Asa Rouse is present. 
the Tiger. Asa and Bruce made a few trips to Jacob Hyatt's at Federal Hall. He stated that every trip to Federal Hall was an amazing experience. It was like taking a time machine back to the early 1800s. He said that his 1968 visit to Federal Hall, the roof was still intact and the house was still in good shape. The second floor was still in good shape and felt safely walking on it. Uh, his brother, I think it was Brother Jack, uh, even walked on the roof at that point. But in the 70s, that all disappeared. Oh, never mind. So you learn a lot from the interviews, as well as searching documents, etc. Uh, it's a fascinating place. You get a complete sense of well-being when you're there and peaceful. There's nothing there but uh, wild animals. There's nobody within a mile of you. If you ever have problems, though, uh, you could be in trouble. Uh, did I put that LiDAR picture up? No, I can't get a picture of a LiDAR. Uh, there's two areas on there that are way up near the river and very high up. That uh, One is a completely flat area where you wouldn't expect it. And if you look at the top section, uh, there's like an indentation there with a bunch of little mounds or something. So my son, uh, Tim Buckley, has said that he will come up with me in March and then with Santy Ellen we'll see what's really up there. These are some new structures that we're looking at. Here's another one. There's a pump sticking out right next to a creek. I don't know how they got the water. I guess the water source stayed up because I don't know. There's the LIDAR picture. No trees. They're gone. When we call it LIDAR, we see a structure here, we see a tiny structure here, that ends up, uh, I was speaking to the McGuire's the other day, and that ends up to be a very small little barn that they had that they kept hogs in. And here's the uh, house site itself, and here's Second Creek, and here's, it's about 300 feet or more of uh, the uh, ferry site. And if you look, you actually come through in here, and you make a wild turn, and this is where it goes up to the house, and this is where it goes up to the ferry area. And then there's a little side room that goes up here too. But LIDAR lets you see things that you normally wouldn't see, like this flat area. There's a completely flat area. I don't, you know, I guess it can happen. Up here you have stuff that look like little mounds of something. But all of this has to be checked out. And that's all I've got. If you have any questions, you want to have it. I just wanted to be sure that Tom Shippard was sitting next to me. Had as much credit as anybody, Bruce or me, because we were all there at the same time in 1968. Mr. Schiffer, I told him he is fantastic. He's allowed me to have had recent pictures that have shown us what was really there at that time. Without those pictures, I wouldn't have even known about those slave workers. There's no way. I wouldn't have known the condition of the house at that time. And you three gentlemen, I hope you've written down somewhere what you found and where it's at for us newcomers coming along, because you evidently found all the log cabins and grist mills and everything else. Thank you very kindly. If we had had the kind of telephone, I mean, the cameras you have now, we'd have had hundreds of pictures. We were thinking about what film cost and where it was a fortune, sir. It was a fortune back then. Oh yeah, and you just didn't. If you were weird the way I was, you just didn't take pictures all the time, even when it would have been a good idea. Yeah. But uh, Bruce and I, and my brother Jack and Tom, were the constants. We had some guests with us at different times. Usually we wore them out. Because I believe it. Yeah, because we could, all of us were walkers. That's when Bruce could walk from here to San Francisco. And now he can't, he can't get across the living room. It was fast. Yeah. It was fast. Well, the thing is, though, we appreciate what we were seeing. But I don't think I wrote down anything. Did you? Not really. 
Well, that was a terrible omission, but sometimes you don't think like you should. Well, if you find these scraps of paper with anything written on, let me know. <laughs> I appreciate it. And over to the right there, uh, that white sign, like I said, you'll see a piece of paper with tariffs that have uh, my name, phone number, and email if you have any questions. Uh, if anybody can tell me who the good soul was that took uh, the uh, Pyatt uh, tombstone probably to the courthouse, and from there it went on over uh, for a uh, gravestone restoration and got set there for many, many years. I'd appreciate this to fill in the knowledge. Thank you, Capone. Oh, yes, sir. Take some credit for uh, Mr. Jerry Pillier. And uh, there may be one or two people in this room knew who he was, but he was a friend of mine. You'll notice that photograph where you gave me credit. I wasn't on stilts. I was in his airplane. airplane. In the dead of winter. In the dead of winter. Thank you. I'm huh, glad you were. Because it really helps. Uh, it's so interesting that that flag you're seeking was in place in '68. We just looked down and saw it there was. Was it in concrete at that time? I think so. I thought so. Yeah, that's what I was told. It was. Well, the DAR flag was on it, wasn't it? Yeah, they put the DAR put it there. Yeah. 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 Well, we know where it's at. We just can't get to it. Yeah. Well, you have uh, more energy than I ever imagined existed. <laughs> Slowly, <laughs> that's it, it all comes from an intense interest, of course. But if you could have been with us, it would be, in 1968, it would have been an enormous advantage for all of us. But we worked over to certainly try to make up for us. Try to preserve the force of all the I'm curious how long the ferry lasted. Uh, that was until 1865. Uh, it was sort of sold back and forth a couple times. Uh, up until about that time, they, they actually only sold the rights of ferry and didn't sell the land. Okay, but in 1865, <coughs> that all left. 1872, the land split off from the pipes, and it goes on down from there. But all this information is in the book uh, for this year at your uh, library here, as well as uh, 12 and 13. And if you got any questions or anything in the future, please feel free. Thank you much.